Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, to uh, Mini SML 2020. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to our mini conference. Um, our mini conference gives you a chance to learn more about some of the papers that our own Edinburgh researchers got accepted uh, into ICML. Uh, ICML is a very prestigious and selective conference, so uh, you will have the opportunity to hear some uh, really good researchers uh, talk about the work uh, they have done. Uh, we'll have two presentations uh, from Josiah and uh, Steven. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, put them into the chat and then uh, we'll go over them after each uh, presentation. Uh, you will then also be given the opportunity or chance to raise uh, your hand so that you can uh, talk about the details of your question if you wish. Uh, thank you much for joining and uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy the talks. Uh, let's start uh, with the first paper. Uh, called uh, Reducing uh, Sampling Error in Batch uh, Temporal Difference uh, Learning. Uh, this is a joint work between uh, Brahma Pause, Ishan Durukar, Josiah Hanna, uh, Peter Stone. Uh, we have Josiah here to uh, give the talk. Uh, Josiah is currently a research associate working with uh, Stefano Albrecht at Edinburgh. Uh, Josiah recently finished his PhD in reinforcement learning at uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he worked with uh, Peter Stone. Uh, let's still come out that to uh, give the talk. Hey. So um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, uh, giving me the chance to speak. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about a paper that we're presenting at ICML um, uh, next week, and um, yeah, just um, yeah, my uh, collaborators Brahma and Ishan, uh, they're really you know the main ones who headed up uh, this work. Um, so um, uh, reinforcement learning for um, uh, is becoming a more in, uh, increasingly uh, um, popular area of reinforcement learning, mainly because of uh, some striking successes which have happened in the um, uh, the past few years. So, for instance, we've seen um, superhuman performance at video game playing, uh, where a computer completely learns to play the video game just from looking at the screen. Um, in the game of Go, the world, the human world champion being defeated by a computer um, using uh, reinforcement learning and search techniques. Um, and there's just been many more applications which have come out. Um, so it's just one more simulated robots um, which have learned all sorts of different skills, such as like these robots here, which can learn to play soccer um, just through interacting with a task. Um, so these successes are like, um, they've been very good for the, the field of reinforcement learning, have grabbed a lot of headlines. Um, but if you, you know, kind of look closer at them, what you see is that um, to be able to learn a successful, um, uh, what we call a successful policy on these tasks, there's a lot of data has to be used. The agent has to interact with the environment for a long period of time um, to be able to learn to complete the task well. Um, and that, that just like currently the data requirements preclude reinforcement learning from being applied uh, to a lot of problems where it potentially could be applied. So the big picture question uh, which motivates my research and, and the work that we did here um, was how can reinforcement learning agents make the most from a limited amount of data? Um, so this paper looks at a, um, a subset and just, you know, looks at kind of like one small part of like trying to answer this bigger question. Um, and it looks at learning uh, what we call the value function in reinforcement learning. Um, and it asks how can we um, accurately estimate the value function with just a small amount of data? So if you're less familiar with reinforcement learning, I'll unpack that a bit more um, over the next few slides with a quick introduction. Um, so yeah, the reinforcement learning world um, is we try to model an agent interacting with an unknown environment, taking actions in order to receive rewards. Um, so at any moment in time, the agent is in a state and it has actions available to it. It takes these actions and its actions uh, cause it to um, cause the environment to transition to a new state, um, and the agent also receives a reward. Um, so when we say the agent chooses an action, what we mean is that the agent follows a policy. Um, and so this policy formally is a mapping from states to a probability distribution over actions. And um, uh, so the agent takes an action, and then the environment transitions to a new state, which in a formal sense means that the environment um, randomly samples a state from a distribution conditioned over the current state of the environment and the action the agent takes. And then as well as the environment transitioning to a new state, the agent receives a reward. 
Um, interaction happens sequentially. So the agent begins in an initial state, takes an action, receives a reward, and the environment moves to a new state. And then this process repeats in a loop, um, uh, possibly for some finite number of time steps, or it just kind of goes on forever. Um, one of the, uh, the central quantities of interest in reinforcement learning is called the value function. So for any state and any policy that the agent could be following, we want to know what is the expected amount of reward that I'm going to get from this state if I follow a certain policy. Um, so formally, uh, what this means is that we're in a state, we sample an action, the environment samples a new state, and this process repeats, um, and we look at the, the sum of future rewards. And it's an expectation because there's randomness in the policies, in the action selection, and randomness in the environment. So, um, you know, just because you start in a state and follow a policy, you may get different rewards um, if you were to repeat the same process. So we just want to know, on average, how good is following this policy uh, from a certain state. Um, so this paper uh, that we're presenting next week is on how do you learn this value function um, accurately. Um, because you have to learn it through actually interacting with the environment and collecting experience. Um, our paper just focuses on the question of how do you learn this accurately, um, but in, you can think of this as it's a building block to how you can learn a better policy, which is the ultimate goal of reinforcement learning. Just as a quick example of like to make um, you know the idea of a value function more concrete, you can think of um, an autonomous driving domain where this agent, um, this agent controlling our car um, might be in a particular state and have a certain policy which defines its control software that it's running. Um, that policy might end up in like one of two different outcomes, either reaching its destination or ending up in an accident. We can associate reward values with these outcomes. And um, so maybe reaching the destination is just a, a small positive thing, but an accident is just a really bad uh, penalty. Um, and so the value function, if we're evaluating this state in this particular policy, is going to tell us how good is my policy start, starting in a certain state. So if under our policy we only had a 15% chance of reaching the destination and an 85% chance of crashing, then our value functions would tell us that um, our policy isn't very good. Um, So that's just a that's a whirlwind um, background of reinforcement learning. So I'm now going to dive more into what is in our specific paper. Um, so temporal difference learning um, is a fundamental algorithm for value function learning. So if you take a reinforcement learning course, um, one of the first algorithms that you learn is temporal difference learning. Um, this algorithm was introduced in uh, 1988, and it's just a building block for many advances in reinforcement learning. Um, so with taking temporal difference learning as a starting point, um, the contributions of our paper are that we first analyze um, TD learning, and we show that with a finite batch of data um, on policy single step temporal difference learning, that's just like the simplest variant of this algorithm, converges to the value function for the wrong policy. Um, so if that's surprising to someone who knows reinforcement learning well, um, Previous results consider the case of infinite, having infinite data, in which case TD learning will converge correctly. Um, but we're looking at what happens when you have a finite amount of data. Um, and after analyzing this problem, uh, we propose a solution. And we propose a new estimator, a new method for learning value functions, which is more efficient um, using a finite batch of data and thus converges to a more accurate value function. Um, so to um, unpack what these contributions are a bit more, um, the batch value function learning setting is the setting that we're operating in. Um, we're given a policy. Um, this is a fixed policy. We're not trying to improve it. We just want to know what is the value function for this policy. Um, and then the environment has its transition dynamics as well, just telling us how states transition. We're given um, a batch of data. So this is interactions of the environment of the form state, action, reward, um, next state, and so on and so on. Um, we assume this is in a, a batch of episodes, like you've, you've ran your policy several different times. Um, and we just want to estimate the value function that I introduced earlier. Um, and we want to estimate it as accurately as possible using the experience we've collected. Um, so like one, uh, what it means to approximate the value function is one of the simplest ways you can do this is you can assume that every state gives you a, uh, a column vector 
of uh, different features, and you want to learn some weights. Uh, you want to learn a linear combination of these features, um, which approximates the true value of that state. And this would allow you to, to like generalize between states you hadn't seen before. Um, of course, the linear function approximation case is just um, is really the simplest case. And some of the, the some of the experiments we present, we actually use um, neural networks um, to give us more powerful function approximation. Um, so right, I'm going to just a few assumptions I'm going to mention right now. Um, we assume in this setting that we know the policy uh, that we want to evaluate, meaning that we can evaluate the um, for any action and any state. We can say what the probability of that action is. Um, but we assume that the transition probabilities are unknown. Um, in reinforcement learning, this is known as being model free. Um, and then the third assumption I'm going to make um, is that we're in what is called the on policy setting. And that just means that um, the data that we have um, the data that we have was generated by the policy that we want to evaluate. Um, and this assumption I'm just making for the purpose of this talk. In fact, our paper also considers the, uh, the more general off policy case um, when data could be generated from any policy. Um, so conceptually, what um, a batch value function learning algorithm does is it's given a finite size data set. Um, and we want to we, we want to give like the best have the best learning algorithm which produces an approximate value function which is as accurate as possible. Um, so our our work is trying to address um, you know what is like the best learning algorithm we can plug in here. Um, so batch temporal difference learning is um, this fundamental approach to this problem. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of step through how this algorithm works. Um, you don't need to follow all of the pseudocode I'm going to flash up here. I'm going to highlight the important parts. Um, but we're just given a fixed, um, fixed and finite batch of data as input. Um, and we're going, to just, we're going to loop over the data. Um, and we're going to accumulate what's called the uh, temporal difference error. Um, this error basically tells us how um, inconsistent our current um, value predictions are from what we're seeing in the batch. Um, and so we're going to compute um, an update for our um, value function approximation, which tries to minimize the inconsistency in our value predictions. So we make these, um, uh, we make an update that depends on all of the data in the batch, like we update our weight vector if we're doing linear approximation. Um, and then we just continue repeating this process until the weight vector we're learning um, converges. Um, so at no point are we collecting additional data um, we just have the same fixed batch of data the entire time. Um, so batch temporal difference learning, um, well, well, I guess, first of all, temporal difference learning um, as a well-known like building block of reinforcement learning will converge to the true value function if it's kept presented with more and more data. Um, in fact, like an infinite batch size. Um, but our question is, where does batch temporal difference learning converge when you just have a fixed uh, batch size? Um, so there's some um, answers to this already in the literature. But one of our um, the new results in our paper is that we show um, that this converges to a certain estimate called the certainty equivalence estimate. Um, I'm not going to, uh, there's a similar result, which is well known in reinforcement learning. Um, the key difference is that um, this earlier result uh, dealt with something called a Markov reward process, which you can think of as the same environment I showed earlier, but no actions. Um, and we're actually trying to look at what is the certainty equivalence estimate once you factor in actions. Um, it's not important to understand this equation exactly, um, but I do want to, I guess, highlight two quantities which appear in it. Um, one is the maximum likelihood estimate of the policy, um, which just means um, in the batch of data, how often did an action actually occur um, in each of the states? Um, and the other quantity is the maximum likelihood estimate of the transition probabilities, meaning just how often did a you transition to a certain state after being in a different state in action? Um, so, uh, but this is actually, um, it's a bit of a problem that you're, um, uh, converging to these a um, value function which depends on the maximum likely estimates of these quantities because what you would really like to be seeing um, in this equation is that you are using the true policy and the true transition dynamics um, but in fact like in general what you have in your batch is not going to be the same of this 
Uh, I'm going to try to make this a bit more clear in the, the following slide. Um, but um, what we, we term this, this mismatch between the, um, uh, the maximum likelihood estimates and the true probabilities, we call this sampling error. And it's just the, the variance that you get um, due to just having a finite amount of data. No. So as an example that will hopefully make that um, a bit more concrete, um, consider this just really simple environment where you have a single state and two actions available. If the agent takes action one, it moves to state one, receives a reward of 30, and then the uh, interaction terminates. Similarly, if it takes action two, it receives a reward of 60, and then the interaction terminates. Uh, the true policy that we want to evaluate will take either action 50-50 probability. Um, and so the true value function um, for this state would give, um, give a value of 45. But if we want to evaluate this um, with just a finite batch of data, um, let's say we have three transitions where we happen to have seen action one more often than action two, the maximum likelihood policy um, is going to say that we would go, take action one two-thirds of the time and otherwise action two. Um, so there's a mismatch between the maximum likelihood policy and the true policy. And what this results in um, using um, uh, the theoretical result that I flashed on the previous slide um, is that the approximate value for the state is going to be 40 instead of 45. Um, so we can see that there is an inaccuracy in the learned value function when we're just using a finite sized batch of data. And our interpretation of this, which uh, motivates our, um, our second contribution, is that um, uh, batch temporal difference learning can be understood as estimating the value function for the wrong policy. It learns the value function for the maximum likelihood policy instead of the true policy of interest. So seeing this limitation in batch temporal difference learning motivates our uh, proposed solution, which we call policy sampling error corrected temporal difference learning. Um, the key idea is that we want to correct learning from the maximum uh, likelihood policy to the true policy. We use a technique called important sampling to accomplish this. Um, so if you're um, already familiar with the reinforcement learning sum, you may uh, think of important sampling as a method for correcting um, uh, a method which is just used in off policy reinforcement learning, used when your data has been generated by a certain behavior policy, which is different than your policy of interest. Um, but so it's important to note here that um, uh, I'm introducing this in this talk um, in the on policy setting. So we're using a technique which is typically used for off policy reinforcement learning, um, but we're using it for an on policy algorithm. Um, so to, just to present um, our method uh, um, in a couple of equations, it's um, very similar to the original method. Um, so on the left of my screen is the original temporal difference update. Um, it's not, not important to like understand this exactly, but um, then on the right hand side, you can see our new PSEC temporal difference update. Um, and the only change is that we add this ratio, this important sampling ratio. Um, and what that ratio says is that if an action in the batch is, it's seen in the batch more frequently than its true probability, um, then we want to decrease the weight on it. And if it's seen less frequently than its true probability, then we should decrease the weight on it. So in this way, we're kind of like automatically adjusting for the, the variation, which just happens to be there in a finite number of um, data points. Um, so with this simple change, I'm going to talk about how the simple change works on, again on this toy example we had. Um, we have the same fixed batch size and the same small problem. Um, but now with PSEC, we're going to reweight the outcomes um, using these ratios. And if you, uh, you know, do the math, it ends up you see that uh, batch PSEC temporal difference learning will compute the exact true value function um, with a finite batch size, whereas batch temporal difference learning um, would compute an inaccurate one. Um, so this is just a simple example, but in fact, this result is, uh, it's more general. Um, you don't need to read everything which I'm flashing up on the screen, um, but have, um, in our paper, we show that um, what we call linear PSEC temporal difference learning um, converges to a more desirable uh, value function. Um, and by that, by more desirable, I mean that I just want to highlight that uh, the value function it converges to 
is using information about the known policy. Um, and so this makes it a more efficient estimator than um, the batch temporal difference learning method. Um, so the idea of estimating the um, policy which generated your data um, and then using important sampling um, has been looked at in other works before, um, and it's been shown to increase uh, statistical efficiency um, there as well. Um, our work is mainly set apart from these um, and that we're the first to study these corrections for state value function, uh, state value function learning. So I'm going to now just uh, to, um, as the last part of the talk, I'm going to present some empirical results. Um, so we looked at, uh, we studied the performance of our method in several different uh, kind of toy reinforcement learning problems. Um, the evaluation metric that we're concerned with is the accuracy of our value function. So we just want to look at, for every state, what is the squared error between our estimate of the state value and the true state value. Um, and we're going to weight, we're going to weight that error by um, how, how much time the policy would spend in each of these states. So uh, just on this plot here, um, I haven't shown any results yet, um, but the x-axis is how much data um, is available to the agent. So the size of our batch, um, and it's given in terms of the number of episodes, um, and the y-axis is, um, is how much error there is. So ideally, um, you want a method which gets as low as possible with as little data as possible. So first showing um, temporal difference, the standard temporal difference learning method, um, it kind of, as you get more and more data, its error begins, it tends towards zero. Um, but with the, um, our new PSEC uh, temporal difference learning method, we get lower much faster. Um, and so you can see for no matter how much data you have, um, PSEC temporal difference learning is able to substantially improve on tempor just standard temporal difference learning. Um, as the one, there is this kind of sudden drop in the curve. And um, so uh, this corresponds to the point in which all possible state action transitions have been seen in the data set. Um, at the point that um, uh, we've experienced all just seen every state action pair, which is only really possible in very small problems. Um, but when you get to that point, PSEC uh, temporal difference learning can perfectly learn the true value function. Um, if the environment is deterministic, um, whereas temporal difference learning, even once you've seen all of the possible state action pairs, uh, that's not sufficient for it. Um, so we also looked at in this a couple of cases where you need more complex function approximation to represent the true value function. Um, and so in this case, we're learning, we're using a neural network uh, to represent the value function. Um, and again, we see that PSEC temporal difference learning is consistently improving over batch temporal difference learning. Um, there are some, uh, I'm not gonna get into this today, There's some. there are some intricacies with the function approximation case um, that I could talk about after or offline. Um, there's additional results in the paper as well. Um, so there's additional theoretical results on um, uh, um, deriving the fixed points of different methods where they converge to. Um, and we look at a large number of additional empirical questions, um, such as how does the choice of function approximator impact results, um, as well as like looking at off policy PSEG. There's a, a number of open questions that this, uh, this work brought up for us. Um, uh, in, as I mentioned earlier, um, temporal difference learning um, has been around for a long time and there's been a lot of extensions to it, a lot of improvements um, as just knowledge and reinforcement learning has improved. So we want to see how the, the insights that we have um, from PSEC apply to like more advanced value function learning methods, as well as policy improvement approaches. Um, one of the really key open questions that um, uh, I'm really excited to look at in the future is that we've, we've mainly just looked at um, uh, batch temporal difference learning. Um, temporal difference learning, though, is frequently applied in a more online fashion. Um, and so I, I'd like to see the insights that we um, developed in this paper extended to the online setting. Um, although there's a lot of challenging questions there. Um, so if anyone has any uh, idea and wants to look at the paper and gets any ideas for that, I'd be really happy to hear them. Um, so to conclude, um, just to leave you with a few takeaways, um, for a finite batch of data, this uh, fundamental reinforcement learning algorithm, batch temporal difference learning, 
converges to an inaccurate value function. Um, we uh, show that this mismatch between the empirical maximum likelihood policy and the true policy can be corrected by using the technique of important sampling. Uh, and then just finally, we introduce the PSEC temporal difference um, method and show that it's a more efficient estimator uh, than temporal difference. Um, so with that, uh, yeah. So with that, uh, that's everything I've got. Here's, uh, I'll just leave you with this uh, picture of my collaborators. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Adja. It has been a really interesting and uh, useful presentation. So now we have some time for uh, questions. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we have also prepared some additional questions. It seems like uh, the audience. Oh, okay. So uh, we have a question for a uh, question from uh, Domas. So. The question is, uh, how do you know the true pi uh, to be used in the important sampling? Yeah, so um, the true pi is the policy that we want to evaluate. Um, and there are cases when you wouldn't know it, but um, it, there are cases when you wouldn't know it, in which case you would want to use, uh, you could still use batch temporal difference learning. Um, but it's often the case it assumes that you would know the true policy. It is, after all, it's the policy that you want to evaluate this. So the context of that would usually be that you have some knowledge of that policy. Um, and so you could know um, uh, know that policy. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess it is like there are cases if you if you didn't know it, you would want to use batch temporal difference learning. Uh, but it'd be a pretty common assumption that you you would just already have that. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, we have a question. Uh, is important sampling the only reasonable way of addressing uh, this problem? Um, yeah. So, well, it's it is the uh, it's the main way that we've thought of. Uh, for addressing the problem. Uh, if, if you have ideas about other ways to address it, I'd be like uh, uh, interested to discuss them. Um, yeah, um, I feel like we felt like, you know, kind of we were able to like, once we identified the problem, um, this seems like a natural way of uh, correcting it because you can kind of, you can view the problem with batch temporal difference learning as if um, you have off policy data, so important sampling seems like a natural uh, solution method. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be uh, interested in hearing, um, you know, any additional thoughts on other approaches that could be taken. Yeah, uh, nice. um, are there any other questions from the audience or we can uh, try to or get some questions from uh, our list? So, okay, so we have a uh, high level questions. So, where do you think uh, this method could be most useful? In what kind of scenarios do you think? Yeah, so it's um, primarily, uh, I mean, the, the use case is when you need to learn a state value function. There's different reasons you would want to do that in reinforcement learning. Um, a common class of algorithms which learn state value functions um, are like actor critic methods. Um, so there would be potential use there. Um, it's also, um, I think it's a um, undervalued problem in reinforcement learning that like it's useful to just like, it can just be useful to evaluate a policy. Like maybe you, you're you not trying to do any type of policy improvement, um, but you just wanna know like how well a particular policy will do uh, maybe for like safety reasons or, um, you know, if you're in like a um, realistic setting, uh, there may be stakeholders who want to know, like, well, how well is this policy that you want to run going to to do in some particular state? Um, so any type of setting where you're learning a state value uh, function is where this is going to be, like, most useful. Mm, okay, see. Yeah, thank you much. Um, we have one more question. So, uh, uh, do you, so uh, what do you think are, like, potential limitations of, the, of this method? Yeah, so I wasn't able to, um, you know, dive too much into the function approximation 
um, results that we have. Um, I think there still is like a lot of open questions about, um, you know, how do you best, uh, um, what is the, so I guess, let me, let me back up in, um, in a more complex setting, uh, you would represent your value function with a function approximator. Um, and you also need to represent your estimate of the empirical policy with a function approximator. Um, so this adds some complexity. Um, in, in fact, you know, I should mention that I think, you know, one limitation here is that we're trading off, we want the most statistical efficiency. And so we're trading off on computational efficiency some. Um, mm, okay, yeah, so um, I think there's still like some open questions on what is like the best way to apply function approximation here. Um, you know, we've kind of, we, in the paper, we try to give uh, practical suggestions for what we found to be the most useful. Um, but I think we can still develop like more robust approaches there. Okay. Uh, so unless there are any other questions from the audience, then uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Joseph, for the very interesting presentation. Also, very insightful answers to the questions. So uh, now we will continue. Uh, thank, by talk thanks from, for having uh, me, by the way. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. It was very nice, very useful. Uh, okay, so uh, now we continue by talk from uh, Steven. Uh, Steven's paper is called uh, Bayesian Experimental Design for Implicit Models by Mutual Information and Neural Estimation. And uh, this is joint work uh, together with uh, Michael Goodman. Uh, Steven is currently a second year PhD student in data science and he's supervised by uh, Michael Goodman. Uh, he's interested in Bayesian experimental design, likelihood free inference, and uh, Bayesian computation. Uh, before starting his doctoral degree, he studied physics at uh, Imperial College London. So, uh, Steven, now you can start. Thank you for yeah. the introduction, Andre. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Steven, and I'm here to tell you about guiding. Oops, the presentation just went away. Um, I'm here to talk to you about guiding scientific experiments using neural network. And um, this is joint work with my supervisor, Michael Gutmann, and based on the recently accepted ICML paper, Bayesian Experimental Design for Implicit Models by Mutual Information Neural Estimation. And I'll start off with by saying that in, we often describe natural processes by statistical models. And many of these statistical models are so-called implicit models, where the data generating process is such that we can sample data from the model, but we can't actually evaluate the likelihood of any of these samples. And this naturally makes the estimation of the posterior distribution, if we're interested in Bayesian inference, very difficult. And so people are forced to use likelihood free inference um, methods to do that. And a neat property of these implicit models is that sampling from the data generating distribution is exactly the same as sample, first sampling some noise from a base distribution and then putting that noise into a deterministic function h which then yields you the same data y and i'll show you later how this becomes useful in our method now as an example let me show you um, a model from pharmacokinetics where we wish to study the underlying kinetics of a drug in a body after it's been administered to a patient and there are a couple of model parameters that we wish to estimate um, during this experiment, which regulate, for instance, how quickly the drug is being absorbed, how quickly it's being eliminated, and also how it spreads through the body. And I've shown you here the drug concentration at a particular time T for one patient. And you can see that I can actually write the statistical model in one line. And this one line, uh, um, also represents this deterministic function that I talked about earlier that takes this input, um, some Gaussian noise and some other noise as well. And if we wanted to do an experiment to estimate these model parameters, we naturally have to decide at what time we measure the blood from a patient. And I've shown you here a, an average variation of the drug concentration as a function of time. And the domain expert might know that waiting very long to take a measurement is probably quite bad because the response will be very low and the drug will have been eliminated completely and the domain expert might also know that measuring 
it um, at, a, at this time where the peak of the dark concentra concentration is, is really good because here the signal to noise ratio is very high. And a domain expert might know all of these things, but we'd like a more systematic and structured way of deciding when to actually do these measurements. And as a tool to help us do that, we use Bayesian experimental design. And the premise of that is that in scientific experiments, collecting data is always essential, but realistically, we are limited uh, with our budget in time or money. And we have to answer the question, how or where do we collect data in order to learn the most about whatever we're trying to study? And a quantity that helps us facilitate that is the so-called design variable D. And these are all the things that affect the experiment which we can control. For instance, for the PK model that I told, to, talked about earlier, these would be the blood sampling times. And then based on these experimental designs, we have to construct a utility function U that tells us the worth of that particular experimental design. And our aim is then to maximize that utility function or that decision function to find the optimal design at which to do the experiment. And obviously, the choice of the utility function is critical here in this point and totally depends on the aim of the scientific experiment. There might be some utility functions that are geared towards parameter estimation, model discrimination, or future predictions. But in this particular work, we're mostly interested in parameter estimation, which is probably the major aim in most scientific experiments. The very principled choice of the utility function for this is the so-called mutual information, which has recently seen a rise uh, in use in machine learning and statistics. Now, what is the mutual information? We can basically understand it as the information gain about the model parameters when we observe particular data y. And it's, I've shown it here in equation three. It's basically just the expectation over the joint distribution of the parameters and data of the log ratio of the posterior to prior density. And it's also equal to the expected kolbach leibler divergence between the posterior and prior distribution. So we have this nice interpretation where, the mutual inf where we're trying to maximize the mutual information, which amounts to finding the experimental design that yields data where the posterior distribution is most different from the prior distribution. But it can also be interpreted as a kind of measure of entropy reduction. So we're trying to reduce the entropy of our data as much as possible. And this is why it has very deep roots in information theory. And the reason we use it is because it's very sensitive to nonlinear coefficients and multimodality. It is, however, notoriously difficult to estimate and optimize, especially so in our case, where we use implicit models and the posterior distribution given here and the joint distribution here are intractable, so we can't actually estimate them. And naturally, because of this and because of computational issues, um, we also can't estimate the gradients of the mutual information. Now, our solution is to actually relax the problem and instead of putting resources into estimating the mutual information to a high accuracy, we consider lower bounds of the mutual information. And to do so, we utilize what's called MIME, which stands for mutual information, neural estimation, and amounts to estimating a MI, so mutual information lower bound, using neural networks. And because we use MIME to perform Bayesian experimental design for implicit models, we call our method MIMEBED. And I've drawn up here a small illustration to show you um, how this works. So in blue, I've shown the true mutual information, which we can't estimate or optimize, but we want to find out its global optimum. So we propose to construct a lower bound, which is shown in red here, which is cheap to compute and for which we can actually compute the gradients. And this allows us to perform gradient descent on the lower bound and find the optimum. But our method actually also allows us to tighten the lower bound at the same time difference between the lower bound and the mutual information becomes negligible. 
And the crux of the method and the real difficulty lies in computing these gradients. And I'll show you later how we do that exactly. Now let's start by first uh, defining a neural network, which we call T in this case, that is parameterized by some parameter psi and takes as input the model parameters and the data y. And we here use a utility that's called the mine f lower bound um, of Bagazi et al. And I've shown that in, in equation four here. And it's basically given by the expectation over the joint distribution of the neural network output minus a normalized expectation of the exponential of the neural network output over the product of marginals. And most important, the lower bound depends on both the experimental design and the neural network parameters. Now, our experimental design problem can now be formulated as having to maximize this lower bound with respect to psi and d in order to find the optimal design. And as we solve the optimization problem in equation five by maximizing the lower bound in equation four with respect to the network parameters and design, we find that as we update the parameters of the neural network, we tighten the lower bound. And as we update the experimental design, we converge to the optimum. And after we've done the whole training process, we actually also obtain a normalized posterior distribution as a byproduct via a simple feed forward pass of the neural network. And this is quite neat because, as I said earlier, for implicit models, the posterior inference is actually really difficult. And getting that as a byproduct without, without any additional effort is quite helpful. Now, I've shown you again uh, an illustration here how this works exactly. Before training, we still have the true mutual information that we can't estimate or optimize in blue. And we randomly initialize the network parameters. So our lower bound will be all over the place and not match the true MI at all. And we probably start off with an initial design that's quite far off the optimum. But after we've done the training, we have found the optimal design, which hopefully is at the global optimum of the true MI as well. And our lower bound is also tight at the optimal design, which is quite important. And this basically amounts to maximizing and tightening a lower bound at the same time. But naturally, we wish to optimize the lower bound by using gradient ascent because that really allows us to scale up to higher dimensions of the design and uh, the network parameters. But to do so, we require the gradients of the lower bound with respect to the new network parameters, which we can easily get via backpropagation. And we also need the gradients of the lower bound with respect to the designs. And this is really the difficult part that we have to look at in more detail. Because when we attempt to simply compute the gradients of the lower bound, we find that because we take an expectation over a distribution that depends on the design itself, you can see here the distributions are shown in red are conditioned on D, we can't actually pull the gradient operator inside the expectation, which prohibits us from com computing them exactly. And this is mainly because for implicit models, we can't estimate the joint distribution here or the marginal distribution because they depend on the design and we assume that we don't have access to the likelihood. And this naturally also means that we can't compute the necessary gradients we need to compute. And also we can't use things such as score function estimators because again, those require the log densities. What we can use is the so-called pathwise gradient estimator. And for those of you that are familiar with the variation and in inference literature, this is also known as the reparameterization trick. And this essentially allows us to estimate these gradients by pulling the gradient operator inside the expectations. And because of time issues and because it's quite a bit more involved, um, I obviously had to leave that out now but if you're interested in knowing how exactly we do these gradient computations, please do have a look at the paper for more derivations and explanations. Now, one very important point is that our approach actually requires us to know the Jacobian J, which is defined as the gradient of this deterministic sampling path that I showed you earlier. 
with respect to the designs. And while this does limit us in our generality, this is still sat satisfied for a large class of implicit models, where, for instance, we have an analytic expression for this deterministic function h. And for instance, the PK model that I showed you at the beginning was exactly an example of that. Or where we have a latent process and a differential observation process, or we have access to the differential equations of the model, which happen quite often actually in science. Or we can actually also use automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobian or estimated. And this last point is quite important because as the capability of automatic differentiation improves, the generality of our method will also improve. Now, there might be some cases for which we absolutely can't estimate the Jacobian at all. And this obviously is a bit more tricky, but we show a fallback solution in our paper as well. Now, let's go back um, to the PK model that I showed you in the beginning, where we wish to understand the kinetics of how a uh, drug spreads after it's been administered to a patient. And here for now, we'll consider a budget of 10 measurements. So that means that our design vector is now 10 dimensional. So it consists of 10 um, time measurements. And our data vector is also 10 dimensional, consisting of a measurement correspond corresponding to each time. And we actually find that for this kind of problem, a small network with one hidden layer is sufficient. And in the top plot here, you can see quite nicely how the lower bound improves steadily as a function of training epochs and converges to a higher value that has a small bias, so a small difference to the true MI value. And in the bottom plot, you can see how the dimensions of the design vector, so the measurement times, change as a function of training as well, and finally converge to three clusters at early times, middle measurement times, and late measurement times. And these are actually quite intuitive as well from a domain expert perspective, because each of these clusters isolate different model parameters and allow us to estimate the remaining parameters better. So this is a very intuitive and explainable um, interpretation. We can also compute the posterior distributions after that, because as you recall, we get um, the posterior density via a simple forward pass of the neural network after we've done the training. And we find that our posterior distributions are narrow and quite close to the true parameter, to the true model parameters, which shows us that our method does yield us quite good designs, which presumably are optimal. So this was a model in 10 dimensions. And now I'm going to show you a higher dimensional model. So here we're looking at a 100 dimensional linear model, which is basically just a straight line in 100 dimensions with some Gaussian and some gamma noise added to it. And our aim is to find some optimal designs that allows us to estimate the offset and the slope of that straight line in an optimal manner. Now here in our case, the design vector and the data vector are both 100 dimensional. And I should say that in experimental design, anything above four dimensions is basically considered high dimensional already. So in the literature, in the related literature, this is quite impressive. And even for, this, for these high dimensions, we find that our lower bound converges to quite a high value, again, with a, lower, with a low bias. And our designs also converge quite smoothly with more design dimensions concentrated around um, the value of zero. And this is quite interesting because normally you, you might think you want to have measurements at large values of the design domain because the other signal to noise ratio is higher. But here our experiment tells us actually that we should make measurements at d equals zero all the time, um, which is basically a very different strategy to what you get in lower dimensions. So an a person actually doing the experiment would have to watch out and not extrapolate from lower dimensions. And we've also run the experiment with one dimensional and 10 dimensional versions of that straight line experiment. And naturally our posterior for 100 dimensions is more narrow and more accurate 
that fall in lower dimensions. But what's more important here in this plot is um, that we can see again how easily and how quite nicely we can compute the posterior density by a simple feedforward pass of the neural network, which is amortized in the theta space. Now, I've, in summary, I've presented to you just now a novel approach to experimental design for implicit models. And I've explained to you how our method uses a neural network to maximize a lower bound on the mutual information. And we find that we update our, as we update our neural network parameters and the designs with gradient ascent, we can find optimal designs and posterior distributions simultaneously even in very dimensional uh, problems, which I showcased to you um, as well. But obviously, I had to leave out quite a few um, explanations and derivations and also examples. So if you're interested in hearing more about this, please do have a look at our updated paper as well, which we'll present next week at ICML. And obviously, I also made my code available on my GitHub repo. So feel free to check that out. It's an installable package. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for a really interesting and insightful talk. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have some time for questions. So uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so it seems like the audience currently doesn't have any questions, but we have some uh, prepared questions for you. So uh, uh, the first question is, uh, is there some particular reason uh, why, why there are some like uh, quite large occasional drops uh, during training uh, for uh, mutual information? So for example, slide like 13 or uh, I think 11. So do you like some oh, you specific mean you... reason? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, these kind of drops. You mean this, right? And mm -hmm. um, this is only a relic of um, using too large of a of a learning rate. So if you if you decrease the learning rate, these will naturally disappear. And as you increase the number of samples you use um, during the training, uh, that'll also disappear. And sometimes these things can happen if, for instance, the change in the designs is too sudden. So if that change is too big, again, if the learning rate for the designs is too big, then think about that. The, the data distribution that you're training your neural network with changes. And if the change in the data distribution for a new design is too big, then basically your neural network is presented with unseen data. And neural networks are known to extrapolate very poorly. And this will basically just mean that the, that the loss function will um, spike because of that, because it's not really seen the data before. And this is one of the main things you need to watch out for when you train this kind of network, because you want to have a smooth um, convergence in the designs in order to avoid these spikes. Mm, okay, see. Uh, okay, so we have uh, other questions. So, uh, uh, what specific applications could be uh, could get the most benefit from this method? Well, the most natural one are scientific experiments, and this is quite wide really because um, we pre we've presented a framework and um, all you need an experimenter would give us uh, would need to give us is just a sampling function so uh, and the Jacobian so really this can be applied to a wide range of scientific experiments in in our paper I've um, shown a pharmacokinetic model I've shown a linear model which is used in geostatistics a lot um, but we've also presented a fluid dynamics um, model where we try and locate a gas leak in an enclosed room in order to um, well close it basically. But other applications that we're working on are, for instance, um, things in microbiology where we're trying to find out the number of proteins um, in, in a given reaction. Or other models might be, for instance, epidemiology. So a very topical thing is uh, COVID right now. Um, for this kind of disease spread model, you'd also need to find out when on, or where do you take measurements in order to estimate how quickly that's spreading as well. Yeah, it looks like the method has like a very large variety of applications. 
which is very nice to see. Uh, okay. Uh, other questions as well. So, uh, so for example, in this case, uh, you managed to uh, use the model for 100 dimensions. And do you think it could be possible to actually use the model for even like a thousand dimensions, or would there be some modifications necessary to make it work in a such large scale situation? So, so there's no theoretical limitation of of mm -hmm. applying that to a thousand dimensions, for instance, as well. Um, mainly because we use gradient descent, so that's a first order method which scales quite nicely with dimensions. If you were to use a zero order method such as Bayesian optimization or some kind of Gaussian process surrogate models or um, random search, for instance, that scales theoretically scales very badly with design dimensions. So for this, okay. mm -hmm. if you were to use that instead of gradient descent, um, which we do actually for cases where we can't compute the Jacobian, then you wouldn't even be able to do 20 dimensions. But because we use gradient descent, there's no theoretical limitation on the number of dimensions, except obviously uh, computational resources. Mm, okay, see. And in terms of the computational resources, so how expensive is this method? So does it, uh, does it run in like minutes, hours, or potentially even days? Uh, so this particular plot you see here can be can be run in a few minutes up to an hour on a CPU. And if you were to run it on a CPU, um, you can obviously improve that. Uh, quite drastically as well. Um, basically, think about just training a normal neural network, but having an additional parameter that changes the transition distribution. But it's basically mm -hmm. just another parameter. So this can be trained just like any other neural network as well. Mm, okay. See. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Or okay. So if you don't have any other questions, so uh, let's thank our speakers again for uh, the very interesting talks. And uh, I'd also like to thank my co-organizer, Ben, and uh, the whole intelligence team for helping uh, with the organization. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the event, and uh, we'll be very happy to see you at our uh, future events.